Welcome, everybody. Um, it's me, Casey Armstrong, over at ShipBob. We have our operator series featuring Aurora Mornings along with Recharge, and we'll get to them in a minute. I believe this is episode three, season two. Um, so glad you guys are all joining us back. As we always kick this off, um, while I do the introductions, if you guys want to throw in the chat where you're calling in from, and then we'll get to, to Tom and Matt as well. Uh, as, as always, I am calling in from Southern California. Um, might be making a trip to Chicago soon, so we'll see if I'm, I'm there on a, on a Wednesday posting it there. So again, just throw in the chat where you're calling in from. It's great to see where people are. Uh, we always see a lot of uh, international people as well, so we shall see. But today, um, in this episode, we, uh, we have a brand, like I mentioned, Aurora, which looks to make everybody a morning person. Um, I am not a morning person, even after three kids, I am not a morning person, but, uh, we'll see. I need to uh, increase my Aurora intake. So, um, we have, we have Tom here, as I mentioned, and after moving to New York city, uh, to pursue a career in technology, uh, he realized he needed a healthier way to jumpstart the mornings. And so we're going to learn a little bit about, about that. And today, you know, we'll talk about moving from self-fulfillment to a fulfillment partner, which is a question we hear about all the time. How you actually build a passionate community that amplifies your brand um, without that influencer price tag how to pick the right technology stack to get you started and keep costs low and finding the right sourcing partner and so as i mentioned we have tom he's the founder and ceo of aurora uh, which is a morning wellness brand that provides plant-based supplements designed to help you get a lot more out of the morning uh, maybe than just uh, injecting yourself with coffee He's also the co-founder of Superco, which is a Shopify agency, and he also uh, owns a Shopify app and lastly invests in direct-to-consumer brands. And so I'm very interested to hear what his approach is there. Um, and then we also have Matt here from Recharge, which is one of the leading um, e-commerce subscription technologies. Uh, we have a lot of customers that utilize Recharge, um, and especially as brands are looking to take some of the learnings from these these technology companies and B2B SaaS businesses with the with the recurring business model, uh, Recharge really empowers them to do that. And so it's just really exciting to see what a lot of people do on top of Recharge and, and just the innovation that we're seeing in the space. And so both of you, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Tom, let's start with you. Where are you calling in from today? Hey, Casey. Um, I'm, I'm Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm calling in from New York City. Great. Okay. And, and, and what about you, Matt? Uh, hey Casey, thanks for having me. Um, I'm over in Portland, Oregon, so over on the West Coast. Okay, awesome. Just yeah. like me, I see we have some people from New York and, and LA and Miami. Uh, we'll see if the international people come in, maybe a little late. So, Tom, um, let's start with you. What, what was the origin story like? Why why create Aurora? Um, well, mainly I've, I've always I've always been like pretty good at the morning um but it's one of those things like everyone everyone wants to wake up and like not feel groggy or like i mean if you've been i mean obviously people do feel hungover but like a lot of the time people just wake up and feel like hazy and like they've slept badly and there's kind of the kind of the morning fog you just kind of really struggle to to lift um so for kind of numbers of for about a, about a year or so i've kind of experimenting with i mean i don't know if you guys have ever come across like but i, I always drop the word adaptogens i normally get like a lot of blank looking faces but it's it's basically a, a kind of a category of, of herbs um and minerals really that help the body adapt to kind of stressful situations um so i was kind of playing around with, with those i mean they've been used for years in in traditional chinese medicine and uh traditional like indian ayurvedic medicine um and I was just playing around with combinations. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm kind of I'm a big coffee drinker, a big tea drinker, um, but I was I kind of wanted something that kind of gave me that morning boost that made me feel fresh, made me feel awake, but didn't give me that kind of caffeine crash you get at 10 a.m. where you're kind of you, you having had three cups of coffee, you're now like weirdly like tired and sweaty and exhausted, um, having only been awake for like two hours. So the whole like impetus behind it was trying to create. Um, product products really that help people in the morning through slightly non I mean traditional but non like Western means so yeah I le lent heavily on um, I mean, a lot of my products are like heavily influenced by Chinese medicine so I, I, I worked with um, actually a traditional Chinese medicinist um, a herbalist here in New York um, and she basically you know helped me personally um, with my my stack, so I can, I'm sure you guys are used to people talking about like, nootropic stacks. Um, it's kind of worked in a pretty similar way, um, but yeah, I just kind of worked with her really over, over a number of months, um, kind of on myself, like for myself, 
Um, and then, uh, like I, I was, I was previously in in a similar world to you guys. Actually, we worked for a company called Addressy uh, Locate, which uh, actually Gina used to be a part of as well. Um, so we we're actually partners with Recharge um, and, and did a little bit of work with Shipbob actually. Um, but it, I'd been there for, for four and a half years, and kind of I feel the the pandemic was was upon us as work from home, and I'd always wanted to run my own business, um, being loosely kind of kicking around a few ideas, had a little dropship business um, and just thought like, this is my chance. Let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's take that plunge. Um, so obviously I'm working from home and I made, made things fairly easy to transition out of. So yeah, basically working with this um, herbalist to kind of come up with the recipe uh, the formula. Uh, and then from there it was, let's kind of try and make it myself. Didn't really work. Let's try and find a co-packer. Um, and basically took it from there, started, started doing it myself. Um, and then, yeah, I've been leaning on, leaning on both of your businesses quite heavily since. Awesome. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but so you, you started the brand recently. Yeah. Um, you tried to do it yourself. Like you said, you found an herbalist, uh, in, uh, in New York. Are you manufacturing in New York or in the U S or overseas? How are you handling that? Well, I was planning on doing, literally doing it myself, like filling, I mean, giving you know, the full backstory, I was um, planning on doing like morning breakfast products, in, incorporating um, incorporating these adaptogens, but then I've, I've subsequently pivoted because it was it was kind of a lot more work to do. I bootstrapped the business and it's it's kind of much harder to do. You've got to, you've got to actually do it in a, um, in a certified food processing facility, um, and then so I, I pivoted to doing um, caps because it was it was kind of a, a, a bit on my fairly tight budget. Was it was a much less significant lift. Um, so yeah, I've, I found a found a really good co-packer in New Jersey, um, so just across the across the river from here. Um, so I've been working with him pretty closely actually. Um, didn't take didn't take too long to get the formula ready for. Um, for kind of mass manufacturing um but it, obviously this is my first foray into it i really was shooting from the hip um i mean i've got a, quite a few friends um in similar spaces doing kind of loosely similar things so i could lean and lean upon them and obviously I, I read a ton whether it's like blogs that you guys put out or like 2 p.m and like a lot of those um kind of industry specific blogs that just um they don't teach you how to make a product but they kind of they kind of help you in, in, in launching and, and providing a, a ton of value and um, just to sort of a newbie like me. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm in the e-com space. So I wasn't completely green, but the whole manufacturing piece was, was pretty hard to figure out initially. So it was just a lot of calls, a lot of meetings. I mean, obviously virtually at the time, yeah. Um, but yeah, just like Google um, and I had just a massive spreadsheet of potential co, co manufacturers. Um, so yeah, that's, it's like a lot of graphs, it's a lot of calling people and a lot. And at that time, like I couldn't actually meet anyone or go to their facilities. So it was, um, it was a little bit of like, like put your finger in the air and like, I hope you hope you find the right person, but it's all, it's all worked out pretty well. Actually. I'm, I'm happy with my, my co manufacturer. So I know you were doing a lot of B2B before. Yeah. Um, and you know, leading leading a few companies in that space, you've you've now launched Aurora, which is obviously in the direct to consumer space. Um, I, I've done similar, where I've kind of ebbed and flowed with different companies. You know, where it's B two C versus B two B. There are similarities, but some of the motions are are pretty different from average customer value and size to sales cycles. And there's there's I'd say the good and the bad of both. Yeah. What were some of the more eye-opening things to you um, kind of pivoting into like the direct-to-consumer space that you were not expecting? I mean, yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with that. I mean, there's, there's the, the more, I mean, I don't want to, I don't know how to say this without sounding like ungrateful, but when, when, a, when a customer has, when you're the only one doing customer service, if, if it's in a B2B world and the, 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 the deal is like, 2000 bucks or whatever for example you don't mind like doing a lot of kind of customer service or whatever to get that over the line but when they've spent 30 bucks on your product um it's like obviously i mean i I love doing it i always want to help the customers but it's a little bit more painful in terms of like kind of value to time if you kind of put that equation in your head like the amount of time you spend dealing with potentially a single-use customer ideally they'd flow into recharge and become 
become a kind of a subscription customer, but you, you kind of do need to be fairly aware of just like where you're spending your time. Like you just can't be in the trenches with individual customers in the same way that you should be on a B2B level. Um, so it's all about like finding ways in which you can kind of do the one to many with, with the, with the B2C customers, but give them the, the feeling that they are being treated like they are a B2B customer and, and that, you, that you're kind of, you're relying on them for your, for your next like salary, like your next, like, I don't know, office payment or whatever. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of trying to create that relationship with, with a, a B2C customer that feel that they feel special, but you, you also don't spend too long doing it because it, it becomes quite, um, the economics become quite poor quite quickly if you do. Yeah. Uh, and I've got some follow up questions on that, but it, it's interesting. You mentioned, you know, that the pain is that, um, you know, you, now you have a lot more customers, which is a great thing, but the average customer value is a bit less. And so I, I'd say glass half full, you have to think of like, okay, how do you scale yourself or, or be more efficient to help them self-serve or answer these quickly? And so yeah. maybe from like a, an operations perspective, and then maybe the answer is it's just you handling it all, but from an ops perspective, and then also from like a technology perspective, how are you handling customer questions and customer support today? So, I mean, so, yeah, so I've ended up um, basically, I've got a couple of people in the Philippines who help me with customer support. Um, this agency, Gina, or you, you mentioned briefly at the beginning, um, we're actually productizing that um, and selling that to other Shopify stores. But yeah, that was basically... Is that, I mean, is that I, Superco I'm, or that's something... That's, that's like Superco, a- yeah. So... Awesome. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I kind of scaled it was was basically just finding finding people who who cared, um, who had a obviously a strong grasp of English, um, kind of an empathy, um, and like and hard work and diligence. And, and I mean, obviously, they're never going to care about the the, the the end result as quite as much as you will as as the business owner. But it's it's about kind of getting as close to that as possible. And yeah, we looked in a few different places. Me and my, my business partner. Um, but I mean, yeah, the, we've got this team in the Philippines who are, who are fantastic, um, and I mean, they're all like actually ex Shopify um, gurus themselves. Um, but yeah, they they pick up support queries, um, and they've they've allowed me to kind of take take a. They've removed a lot of that off off my plate. I mean, I was I was dealing with I mean only like a couple of months ago dealing with a ton of like Aurora support queries and questions, and it, it is just very time consuming. Um, in terms of platform. Um, I did use Zendesk initially, um, but have been using Gorgeous recently. Um, I think I mean I feel like they've recently come across a lot of money as well because they suddenly hit me up quite heavily across a number of channels and a, and a few other um, similar similar folks in, in similar businesses. I've been speaking to kind of swear by them. Actually, I know a couple of people there from from other um, businesses that used to work, work out. Um, so yeah, they've they actually did a really good job. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys are partners with Gorgeous. But yeah, we partner, we partner, partner with Gorgeous a lot. Um, yeah. And we hear them come up all the time. Definitely one of the leading customer support platforms out there. Um, yeah. Nice that Matt chiming in there. Uh, they're, they're based just um, up in Canada. And I see, actually, I saw a bunch of the chats coming in late once I call out international. So we have some people in Toronto, broadly Canada and Calgary. So uh, it's, it's always good to see some people come in from Canada as well. Um, and I also, I mean, this is what I love talking to entrepreneurs so much is, you know, you've got Aurora, you're trying to find ways to optimize your time and you go out, you find these Shopify gurus that, um, you know, you can start to scale your, your support. And then instead of putting your feet up, you're like, okay, well, this is interesting. A lot of people need this. Let me actually now create another company. Um, and cause this is like maybe something, cause there's the human element that, uh, people need to help, you know, answer a lot of questions for their community. So, uh, I want to get back to Aurora pretty quickly after, but with, with Superco and rolling this out, what would have been some of the interesting learnings there? Um, enrolling, um, you know, this offering up for other brands and, and maybe how are you feeding that back into how you run your business? Well, I mean, the uh, Aurora like ori- originally came from 
Uh, sorry, Supercar originally came from, I mean, building Aurora. I'd, I just launched, I wanted to do some development work on the store I'd kind of knocked together and speaking to agencies, they wanted like X amount a month to retainer and then the freelancers basically wanted a monthly minimum or they weren't going to be able to like give you any hours. Um, so me and my, my business partner who, who's been basically building digital products and, and Shopify sites in the UK for, for a number of years came up with this other way, which was kind of, we built a whole SaaS platform in which a store owner can go on and put in a ticket and say, I want a landing page or this picture formatted or help with support. So we basically, that's kind of the, that's really the kind of where, where Superco came from. But yeah, in terms of like how I've been kind of growing the offerings at Superco is basically from what I've been struggling with Aurora. I've basically weirdly created an agency to solve all my own problems um <laughs> which i mean i probably could have just found someone to do a lot of them but um yeah i don't know it, it just kind of weirdly naturally kind of came together um just ended up working with one of my best friends from home i guess in many respects like working at aurora was it is it's really fun and really challenging but it's a lot a lot of the time i've i've been by myself with freelancers so i've subconsciously i think my mind was like we i need a business partner but not on aurora and i've ended up just kind of having a side business i'm doing with a friend that basically supports aurora but also then services tons of other businesses that's great and obviously not the the, the perfect analogy in a, a little bit smaller scale but you know that's that's what one of the things that amazon does so <laughs> AWS came out from them having to, you know, scratch their own itch and they've monetized that rather well to say the least. And now they're doing the same thing with ads where they actually generate more revenue off of ads um, than they spend on marketing themselves, which is just, just mind blowing. Um, so, so something, you know, you mentioned earlier is making the customers feel special, which is always, you know, important. Um, and I want to get into some of like the the cost and margin questions, but first, you know, you you do some. It sounds like you guys do some custom packaging, and, and you did that on day one. Yeah. So why was that so important to you, and why did you, especially as a bootstrapper or you know funding it yourself, as you mentioned, um, you know, wh why did you say I I've got to do that, even if it's going to cost me more money up front or or hit the bottom line? I mean, I think ultimately it's, it's that kind of, you go into your, I mean, it, it depends where you live. Um, but for me in my apartment building, you go into the packet packaging room and everything is like Amazon or just generic um, kind of brown recycled cardboards. And then now and again, you'll see like a Hubble contacts or like, I mean, obviously like rent the runway is kind of a bit more, a bit, obviously it's like a suit bag or, or whatever, but you, you see these kind of these standout brands that, through necessity or through just their kind of that brand marketing have have made the decision that yeah we're going to take a little bit of a hit on on our margins but we're going to create something that's more of a joy to open more of a someone opens the the the, the parcel room and there's like a, a blue and yellow aurora box is far more exciting than I mean, for me, I go into this room and I struggle to find my post because everything comes in like brown copper boxes and I spend about 10 minutes trying to find everything. But if it came in like the, the brand colors, like I'd walk in there and I'd see it and I'd, I wouldn't have to wait. I wouldn't have to like faff around look, looking through piles of stuff. Um, so it was all about trying to create that kind of spark of excitement there. Like when that, maybe maybe it's not in a locker room, maybe it's just dropped off on, on a front porch in, in rural Georgia or wherever it is, but it it's 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 kind of hard to quantify like it's impossible to quantify um but and inherently to me it feels like it, that's the kind of brand i want to be making instead of just like brown paper brown like cardboard box it's it is definitely a hit on the margins um so financially i'm not sure it's necessarily the, the best route but 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 from like I, a differentiation standpoint i love it because yeah your, your space just like many others there's so much competition um, and so you do need to stand out and a lot of people do live in apartment or condo buildings where there's, you know, you go in, uh, you know, to the delivery room and there's just, like you said, it's a sea of brown boxes. And so how do you stand out and then really make people happy that they bought it and come back again? Because you're, and we'll get to the coming back again part in a second, you know, especially cause I know that's how you utilize recharge. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's, it's really differentiating and, and you're trying to build that brand and that community, which is actually the next thing I want to uh, jump into after we talk about margin for a little bit 
because I know that's something people are often thinking about. Um, and I like how you mentioned Hubble. We had Hubble on uh, last season. It was just great to hear their story as well. So in regards to that, like, who do you, who do you use, if you don't mind sharing, for the packaging? And how do you evaluate those options? And, and then how do you kind of bake that into, you know, the total cost of goods sold? Sure. So we use um, Packlane. Awesome. Um, I looked at, I can't remember, I looked at a couple, I forget the other one, but Packlane did a, did a pretty good job on all the, or like I, 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 I basically, I, when, I, when I was launching, I looked at three, um, two of them escaped me, one's the kind of the big DTC one that uh, you'll be able to, probably be able to help me. Maybe um, Lumi. Lumi, yeah, but they had like quite large, I mean, they had massive minimum orders um, to start. And then the other one, Arca. Was okay, great. Third one, yeah. So pack lane, uh, it was basically pack lane and Arca, and I can't, I can't for the life of me quite remember why I, I end up choosing pack lane. I think, I, if I think it was just better communication, better, um, better samples they sent through. I think they just kind of got me and what I was trying to do a little bit better. Don't, don't mean uh, any kind of disrespect to Dark. I'm sure they did a fantastic job, but it, it, at the time, it just didn't feel, it didn't feel quite right. Um, so yeah, I went with went with pack lane. Um, and yeah, I just I just add the add the cost of the book uh, kind of add the cost of the box like straight into my cogs, so it it is um, yeah it is quite a noticeable um, a notable like chunk out of my margin. That being said, um, like I I've, I've definitely definitely got um, new clients from it. Like it's it's kind of hard to quantify. I do have a, a unique. Um, there is a there is a code on the inside that people can use, um, like a, it's kind of a single use code that people can use for um, like sharing around, and there's definitely been purchases on it. I don't think it's a huge amount. It definitely hasn't paid paid for the boxes, um, but it's yeah. I, don't, I think I find it's just kind of a necessary. In all, as you said, like the supplement space is, is incredibly congested, incredibly overcrowded. So I yeah, I made the kind of very conscious effort to try and make the boxes stand out. Um, to use recyclable packaging, um, all of which, again, just like eats into that margin. That being said, like the margin on supplements is is not terrible, but it is an incredibly competitive space. So anything you can do to like keep those margins down and give you a bit more, um, give you a bit more leeway on, uh, on on your CAC is 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 ideal. But like, yeah, it's 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 an it's it's expensive, but in my mind, it's the necessary cost to. to helping to build the brand nice well like you mentioned the supplement space your, your margins are just um larger compared to maybe some of the other verticals um you also have the subscription component and so I, and i and i know you know your your hero product goes for about 38 dollars. i'm not sure how many units people often order if it's one or one and a half or two um and so maybe that helps cover some of it as well and then you have the subscription side and so we can dive some deeper into the subscription the subscription side, but first, I guess, did that did that factor in at all, or maybe in how you approach things? Because you know, or I guess, how do you think about subscriptions um, from like a macro level perspective? Because you can maybe break even on CAC, um, or I don't know what your target is on day one, knowing that X percent of your shoppers return over time, and after that, it's it's more or less you know just pure profit. So, how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, obviously, with the kind of cost of, cost of Facebook ads, uh, Instagram ads these days, like I, I, it's it becomes it becomes pretty and it, bootstrapping a bootstrapping a business like this, it becomes pretty unfeasible if you're not nearly breaking even on your first purchase. That being said, like knowing that you do have a significant chunk of your clients going through your recharge or going through your recharge checkout and purchasing three, four, five, six, seven times is like it is it is a serious weight of your mind, knowing that you do typically see this kind of like this kind of average play out um over time. That being said, yeah, like I, I can't it's not like I've taken ten million dollars in funding. Like I can't front load this and and buy all these customers in the hope that the kind of the the LTV like works its way out, um, but like as we're kind of slowly growing, slowly kind of putting a bit of gas on, gas on the on the fire, like having having that recharge or like I mean subscription component in general is is just kind of a really helpful um, 
piece of pie that that you know is will kind of over the long term will just make some of those unit economics a bit easier to swallow. What percentage of your um, your customers uh, utilize subscription? About it's about between thirty and forty. Hmm. That's rather nice. So, so yeah. Matt, I'm going to jump to you real quick. I've got quite a few questions. Yeah, sure. When okay. you're, well, well, first, welcome again. Thank um, you for having me. When, uh, maybe across like your customer, your customer set, like from a, you know, subscription percentage, what are you guys often seeing? Uh, in terms of how many, like, customers our merchants have no no so um, like, Tom, like Tom mentioned about 30 to 40 percent of his customers utilize subscription uh yeah. the base so like what are you seeing just as i think of a lot of brands are trying to think of through like and i'm sure it depends on vertical but things through different benchmarks of like all right how much better should i could i be doing based off of possibly my offering or something else yeah no uh 30 uh to 40 percent is, is a good range um you know uh for uh, things like that. yeah i guess you could say uh you know getting going in your business um and, and rapidly growing in, in that stage. Uh, so we have like a scalable solution and we have like different uh, sizes of merchants. And there's always that stage where, you, you know, you're starting with 10 and then you get to 20% and 30. And then there's a stage where it tips over to 50% and you're like, I am a solid subscription company now, you know? So um, with the accounts that I worked uh, with this past year, uh, just for context, I've was on the account management team for the past year, working with merchants through the pandemic and all that all that fun stuff. Um, we had a lot of those conversations um, where their subscriber base was growing, uh, you know, due to uh, their acquisition and it is capturing. It's like what you guys are mentioning, uh, acquiring those customers, getting them to uh, their subscription model, and then seeing that retention engine going. And then from there, it just keeps the percentage keeps going up. So. Uh, different verticals see different things and also different merchants see uh, different um, <laughs> different metrics. But yeah, I'd say um, right before that 50% range is uh, typically what, what I've seen. So. Nice. And what, what about, so something that Tom mentioned also was, was LTV mm -hmm. or, and for those of you, that means lifetime value essentially from, from one customer, how much revenue are you generating over the entire time that they're a customer? which is always a tough thing to, men to, to uh, track because when does the lifetime end? Um, but Matt, with, mm -hmm. from what you guys are hearing or, or seeing from your customers there, what kind of impact are you typically seeing from customers who will utilize the solution like recharge with subscription in, in expanding that LTV? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it can go pretty deep, right? So in the, on the retention side, I feel like that's where, on a macro level, that's where we're seeing everybody focusing now. Um, you guys kind of mentioned earlier with, again, with the cost of acquisition going up over the past couple of years um, and subscription being a, a good resource for businesses to retain uh, or have recurring payments for their business. So, you know, we have out of the box, it's like a customer will go and subscribe and save, uh, get introduced to a subscription strategy. Um, and with you know some well put messaging and positioning from, from the brand, you could position your subscription strategy to the customer as a community um, or as a club. And so the lifetime value at that stage, and this is what I've been seeing uh, a lot lately, is um, you, you essentially are getting those customers to be uh, like it, you're just, you're tapping into brand loyalty at that point. So. Really, it's um, like, yeah, it's one of those things where you look at the data, you see how many subscribe or how many reoccurring payments a customer is going through. Um, seeing, you know, like okay, they bought the first initial purchase, they hung around for two uh, two reoccurring orders, essentially whatever your cadence may be. If it's usually it's typically a month, and then you see, okay, wait a second, they decided to cancel for some reason and in recharge we have uh, our cancellation retention strategies which essentially allows the customer to get feedback so what i like to do with a lot of my accounts is look at that data and see why did those customers cancel and so once we start dissecting that data we can then start moving that goal post on lifetime value um, addressing the pain point of the customer maybe they got you know product fatigue um like okay maybe it's time to offer a different product or you know change change something up about that experience um 
And to back it up, from my perspective, I always look at pretty much the whole the whole thing, the whole funnel through like the customer journey, essentially, and how they're experiencing it. Um, so yeah, well, lifetime value is like one of those things that um, different for everybody. Um, everybody has different stages that they're addressing, um, and yeah, it, it could be it could be off, on for like a lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and Tom, question for you still around the subscription side from Dana. Um, do you get a lot of people canceling because they have too many? And, and how do you handle people canceling or maybe wanting to extend um, the time frame in between their subscriptions? Because it's actually a very good question because it ties into kind of what we were talking about before and kind of dealing with customer support. Um, and this is actually, actually, funny enough, one of the customer support tickets I would probably see the most um, in that. I mean, it's a monthly subscription. There's basically there's a, there's a capsule per day, um, which I, I mean, yeah, there's 28 per day. Um, so there's always there's always going to be like a couple more. And if people miss a week, if they go on holiday, maybe they don't want it. So yeah, that was a question I used to get. Well, I mean, I, I still do get quite a lot, but I have subsequently farmed out to my, my customer support team. But like, how do I how do I deal with that? Um, I mean, Recharge does provide a pretty easy way for them to like skip a delivery, or you can like you can just push it down the line. Um, so in terms of like, you would get a lot of people saying, "Hey, I've got too many. Can I cancel?" It's quite an easy. It, it's it's not too hard to just kind of guide them towards being like, hey, no, I totally understand it. How about you just skip a delivery and then you can get through your, your current batch. Um, and then you kind of still keep them on the subscription wheel. Uh, you don't lose them as a customer. So it's obviously much harder to get them to come back again um, once, you, once you lose them. But yeah, Recharge does make it pretty easy to basically just push the next subscription like down the line a little bit um, and, and you, you can keep them. Yeah, I've seen that with some stuff that I've purchased as well. It's, it's nice sometimes you can just hit the snooze button. And I know as a brand owner, um, and I've done this actually from a B2B SaaS standpoint as well, is uh, you need to offer that snooze option because you'd much rather have them come back later and still be thinking about it versus to completely lose them. So yeah, um, you've mentioned you know Shopify, which is your platform. You've mentioned Gorgeous, which is your customer support tool, Packlane. Um, which is your custom packaging recharge for subscription ship Bob for fulfillment. Uh, honestly, that, that tech stack is, is rather common that we come across a lot. So a question we've got over it in the polls. If, if the, those attendees want to jump over and cast your vote, I have a question, Tom. So yeah. which part of e-commerce costs you the most? Is it the maintenance and the upgrades? Is it fulfillment? Is it integrations or all these third-party apps? Is it the platform? Like, you know, what's costing you the most? Um, probably you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I get that. Like, I mean, I've, you, you guys are doing stories. Right, just kidding. Like, it's not like you're just a little SaaS product that doesn't like once you've made it you can replicate like a million times at no incremental cost like every extra customer you have is more warehouse space every time they ship a product out costs like shipping fees um so yeah it is it is you guys but it, there's plenty of reasons why that isn't shouldn't be too surprising awesome we'll dive into that then because <laughs> you you know it sounds like you do a good job of figuring out like what are the time bottlenecks that you're running into to scale your business and then how can you find trusted partners to hand it off to um, and so earlier in your early in your journey, you came to us at ShipBob uh, to hand that over because it is a very time intensive business, and people want to get you know uh, fa fast and affordable shipping for their customers and that global reach. And so you know, talk me through that process that you went through, and um, you know what, why you decided to take the plunge from doing it yourself. Yeah, so I mean, it was, it's kind of a, it's like a time value kind of equation in your mind, like is it worth my time spending like five hours a day doing fulfillment or like trying to manage some guy um, and do fulfillment for my bedroom or for my flat or maybe I'd hire, hire a space down the road and do that. And then I have to worry about like, am I getting the best deal with my shipping? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, mental like, energy that needs to be expunged to kind of work out how to, to do all that at a, at the kind of rates that you guys can get. Um, and then in addition, like all of the, all of the time and effort that goes into individually packing stuff, make, make getting these boxes, storing these boxes, making these boxes, printing all the labels, making sure the, that the, I get them to the post office or, or however I'm, I'm getting them out. It's just a massive drain on, on my time. Um, 
So I quite quickly decided that like that money would be much better spent um, utilizing a third party fulfillment um, business such as Shipbob. Um, I looked at a few, I looked at a number um, and ended up going with you. And I can ask me why now. I can feel it. No, we, we can get <laughs> that in a second, but no, appreciate that. And because because I do want to talk dive deeper into you know what what you are now doing with that free time. Again, not that you necessarily got a lot back. Maybe you're just sleeping slightly better. It is funny when I'm talking to prospective customers of ours, and then you'll see sometimes in the background, it's just stacks of boxes and packaging and tape and random products. Yeah. And so it's nice to get that out of, um, uh, you know, out of your house or your apartment or, or your, your office. It might have been a different scenario if I lived in like a suburb or somewhere rural and I had a, a garage or like easy access to cheap space. But living in, in Brooklyn, it was kind of not really going to be particularly feasible from the get go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, so we get a qu- quite a few questions now coming in from the audience. And, and again, on the time side, I want to get into you know, now how you use, utilize some of that to, to build a community, because I think that's where a lot of our customers also see a lot of value. It's like, well, let's hand off something like fulfillment, like unless you're an ops or supply chain expert, that's not going to be your differentiator um, from like your internal skill set. That's why you, you hand it off to the experts and you'll do something like focus on community building. But before we get to that, um, again, I want to answer these questions. So first one from, from Saima, uh, do you send the customer their package in a custom box every month or is it just that first month when they're a new subscriber? Um, that's a very good question. Currently, yes, but that is definitely something I'm, I'm working towards doing. So I, I want to get subscriptions in the, in the future coming in. Um, I mean, not even in a poly mailer. You can get like a um, the like recyclable paper mailer. So the, the, the initial subscription comes... I mean, any single purchase comes in a, a glass jar with a uh, kind of a metal lid, so it's all completely recyclable. Um, but I want to do that. I haven't, I haven't kind of gotten around to doing it. it requires a bit more um, kind of rejigging my ops um, side. But yeah, that's where I'd like to get to in the next kind of couple of months. I think the next kind of three to six months, ideally, we'll be doing subscriptions in a in like a. Um, in, a, in an entirely uh, like recyclable, really, um, or, or compostable, even um, paper mailer. Yeah, so a, a few brands do that. Um, I'm struggling to think, but some other supplement brands do that. Do that. So yeah, that's kind of where I'd like to get to, but not yeah. there yet. That's great. Yeah, yeah. we've got to mention on our on our. I think it was our last operator series. Um, we had Pachama on and a handful of merchants from Pachama. And so we announced that our fulfillment network is 100% carbon neutral. Um, as you talked about the recyclables, we have our integration with Pachama and our app store. So, you know, all of our merchants, can, you know, can rather quickly have it. So every single order that they ship is carbon neutral. I know that's something that's very... I don't, I don't know Pachama. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll drop in the link and, you know, Gina or I will follow up afterwards. Um, definitely worth checking out. What they're doing is, uh, it's it's not just something a lot of customers and and the and the merchants want, but it's actually doing something truly good for for the world as well. So it's it's nice when when those cross. Great. Um, so, so here's a question from Toby. Um, I, I like how he he positioned as well. I'll probably read it more or less verbatim. Do you think that um, if you were to price the product higher, say fifty dollars a month? versus 30 so that'd be about a uh 60 jump in what you charge today um that you'd lose more customers because you know if there's a lot of brand strength they shouldn't necessarily move away hopefully so i guess what's your take on that when you're when you're juggling like the pricing um yeah, I mean, that's something I've played around with. I mean, I actually initially launched with higher prices and then actually brought it down a little bit and, and definitely saw more conversions at a lower price point. So it's it's a, it's an inch, it's, I mean, I think the pricing question, I mean, it applies to kind of anything you're trying to sell. Um, but I think the short answer is, is I would probably lose more custom I, I mean i'm almost certain I'd, I'd i'd lose a lot of my current customers and would find it harder to acquire new ones um i think with if i was to kind of have a load of funding and i could kind of do some like 
it's a more serious brand marketing. Um, I could probably get to a point where I could justify that. Um, but even, I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like that, that price point, it's still pretty high. I think I'd rather, I'd rather l like a higher volume of customers at a lower price point than a, than a lower volume of customers at a higher price point, I think in general, mm -hmm. just because of like, I'm going to be going forward, planning to sell other products and things. And I'd, I'd rather just have a, have a, a broader customer base, um, that I could sell to. Nice. I, I like that. I mean, every, a lot of these answers, especially with pricing, the real answer is it depends when people ask for these broad stroke answers. And, but, but I like how you are thinking about it strategically there where, you know, you, you've got your hero product, you want to expand the catalog and what, what the brand actually means, or I guess what the brand um, provides. And so having, having a larger customer base is, is important for you as you're going to want to be able to introduce additional products. Here's, a, here's another question from Saima, and, and Matt, maybe you could be best to answer this. It's a bit more tactical. So if you're just offering, let's say, custom packaging or certain type of packaging in that first month, or maybe you offer like additional inserts or something, whatever it may be, uh, how do you keep track of a new subscriber versus a recurring subscriber? Is that so that's in terms of like someone purchases and yeah, I, I come through, I buy Aurora. It's I subscribe. It's my first package versus yeah. like, you know, the recurring subscription. Um, so I, mean, I, understand this I mean, if they, if it's a single purchase, they, they just go through the regular Shopify checkout, but if, if they, uh, yeah, I think she's saying, uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump onto your subs, um, subscription. Yeah. And it's, there is the time where I receive my first package yeah. where you want to knock that out of the park, but then I'm getting, let's say every 30 days, I'm getting another box and you yeah. talk about maybe I use a poly mailer or maybe I use a, a brown compostable, like, you know, how, how do you track that in recharge or Shopify or, or ship off? Oh, right. So, um, so I mean, I haven't done like I, I, I do my own modeling. Um, I pull out the data from from Recharge and Shopify and model that out. And are we, are we talking kind of cohorts here, like diving into like how how long these how long these uh, individual subscriptions last? Or well, well, maybe Matt, if you want to jump in, like sure. from from tagging these yeah, within the system to know like right. again how how to treat these customers in regards to like their fulfillment experience and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a number of different places you can look in uh, Recharge and Shopify. Um, in Recharge, you know, if you look at the data through either our, our enhanced analytics or through our exports, there is, it, it'll show you the, what number of recurring order it is for the customer. Also in Shopify, if you look at the orders that are coming through, uh, Recharge will tag that order with either um, first subscription, I believe is the tag. Uh, and then everything after that will be a uh, recurring uh, subscription. It'll, there's a different identifiers that you can use. And so what we see in other, um, no, there, there you go. So what we see in other uh, <laughs> merchants do is those tags and that information will be passed on to the fulfillment center. And then the fulfillment center will say like, oh, okay, this is a specific number in the order. Um, let's change it up this way or that way uh, to kind of change the experience for them as the customer is receiving the products, uh, um, you know, on the, on the tail end. So it keeps things exciting that way uh, in terms of the subscription. Perfect. And, and I know that's how we do a lot of the things over at, at ChipBob is creating different rules based off of different tags, yes. depending on the, the integration that we're pulling in the data from, for example, like Shopify and the example you mentioned um, so that we can, we can manage them a little bit differently if that's what the brands are looking for. So, you know, you always got to keep thinking through that as like you're understanding your business uh, and e-commerce just, just evolves in general. And so uh, I, I like it. We got more questions on subscriptions and, and recurring revenue, which is something that I am I'm very fond of uh, from Samuel. Um, and, you know, Tom, do you have any tips for converting the first time non-subscribers into recurring subscribers? Yeah, uh, email marketing. <laughs> See, uh, it's. I mean, I, I, I lean very heavily on Clavio, um, and actually does does a really really good job. So I work with a, a, a fantastic freelance email marketer, um, and yeah, I mean, basically we kind of you, you build a kind of subset of of first time purchases, and then basically hit them with hit them with discounts or like encourage them to like to sign up for subscription um, in the future. So yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty kind of 
like ecom marketing 101 pretty pretty straightforward but yeah basically just kind of using the using the availability of, of email marketing to to drive these people like you kind of drive them to write a review those that write a review obviously kind of enjoy the product and then you can kind of with them um just kind of nurture them really into into kind of becoming subscribing customers as opposed to just one-offs so yeah i mean i i, I guess that can answer the question but email marketing really is the one for me is the kind of lever for me that i use quite awesome. heavily and, and then and then um matt we've well, got maybe a potential customer from simon here she's asking for your uh your contact information but the question is I, I switched my domain from squarespace to shopify and i'm using recharge but having trouble pulling my current subscriber list over that's probably a question not for here or maybe <laughs> because you might need to get into the specifics of what's happening there right uh, maybe matt you feel this a lot so you tell me i mean i could provide uh, some more like helpful information on that front um Perfect. so yeah we, we do have a uh, migrations team specifically here at recharge so when it comes to migrating um subscribers you just want to uh, reach out to support that will get uh funneled to the right team uh, and they'll take care of you Perfect. I like it. And from an integration standpoint today, what platforms do you guys integrate with? Um, oh, yeah. So um, we integrate with, you know, of course, Shopify. Um, we integrate with BigComps. Um, and so I think generally the idea, uh, you know, the, the path we are seeing uh, in terms of what the market is uh, wanting out there in e-commerce is a, a bit more flexibility, essentially. So Recharge has been focusing more on its API and its functionality to enable merchants on any platform to uh, do subscriptions, essentially. So, yeah, but uh, the, the main one, uh, Shopify. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, community building. Tom, how have you approached community building uh, and... You know, you're, you're, you're selling a product to help people, you know, wake up better, start the day better. Um, you know, what, what's, what's a community look like? How have you approached that? Talk me through community a little bit. I always find it fascinating just the different angles that people go about it. Sure. Um, so, I mean, being, being in the midst of a, a pandemic, it's been hard to kind of do a physical kind of community. I, I would, once everything kind of opens up properly, I do have kind of grand ambitions and I'm obviously I'm moving back to the UK so it might be a little bit harder but I, I've, I've been pretty keen to do actual kind of physical morning meetups um, both kind of here in New York City and kind of around the country um, but in, 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 lieu of, in lieu of that um, and kind of in, in the digital world that we live in basically been focusing mainly in and around like um, kind of Instagram um, like I've got a, a private Facebook group that um, I basically kind of, if you if you're a purchaser, you can kind of you get access to, and and within that, um, we just kind of discuss both the products. We discuss um, um, like how like how people can kind of get more out of their morning, not just not just from like things you can take, not just from like raw supplements, but also from like blog posts that we're writing, guest blog, blog posts that we're planning. Um, maybe it's like a podcast that I've, I've been on or that kind of other people or, or, or other things that people want to discuss. Maybe it's like polls, but it's, it's basically trying to kind of get people in like a room, like a, a digital room or, or a physical room, just talking about like the, the issues that your products are solving. Um, like, so, like, what, what is it beyond just like, Hey, I want to wake up and have a better day. Like, or maybe that's just it. Like, what what is the underlying, um, or you know, theme, or maybe like the s subconscious element of it that is having everybody that's wanting to like discuss this, or you know, come together as a community around this. A lot of it's like productivity. Actually, that's kind of a, I've discovered is seems to be like the core theme that runs through a lot of of what the discussions are, what like people are talking about, what. Um, like it's becoming kind of more like key. It's probably what will will feed into some of the other products I'm going to release later on down the line. But yeah, like it's people kind of wanting to wake up and and not be groggy for their first like couple of hours at work. They kind of want and, and just kind of get into it and be productive. So that tends that seems to be kind of 
I guess the thread that binds a lot of a lot of what we do together is, is just like how to be more productive in the morning, like how to be more kind of focused, whether that's like helping your kids get ready for school or whether that's like getting out of bed, making like a quick breakfast and then jumping into your emails. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like that. I think really, if you boil everything down is kind of the essence of, of what we're trying to solve. It's, it's like a it's like a kind of improve your productivity in the morning. Can I, jump, can I jump in here really sure, fast on that? Oh, cool. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So uh, I just want to say I'm a subscriber. I'm a fan of the community. <laughs> I'm definitely in that uh, <laughs> the demographic of like wanting to have super focus. And what I'm noticing is like uh, other friends and colleagues that like are also into the same thing. Um, you know, everyone's been working from home through, you know, uh, the pandemic essentially. And they're just sitting in a room with really not much distractions, you know, unless you know, kids and stuff. Um, but yeah, was, I've stumbled upon across like YouTube videos that are strictly for focusing. And then you look down in the comments and it's a whole community of people thinking the same, like looking for the same thing. It was just like deeper focus, deeper concentration, especially waking up and, um, you know, going to work essentially on your computer at home. So um, it's definitely a community out there. Probably. That's awesome. I, I, uh, I love that when you, you just got, you just scratch a little bit below the surface, and like what is it people are looking for? And all you have to do is look at like, how many productivity apps are out there? What are like this, what's the search volume on Google or YouTube for productivity hacks? Um, you know, Tim Ferriss has made a career, um, rightfully so, on essentially being more efficient with your time or the food that you, you know, put into your body. Um, and so that's interesting. I, I know when I was up and running a company called Paleo Hacks, um, you know, one of the things that we noticed was uh, especially with like the recipes. Yeah, people wanted to like cook, um, you know, good tasting food in a more healthy fashion. But some of it was also just like status signaling where like they want to be able to say that they're cooking like the, the latest cool paleo meals. Cause like, what is that? What is it that's bringing people back every single time and like creating this rabid fan base? And, you know, you just got to dig a few levels deeper. Yeah. So um, I want to jump into the VC space with you real quick. And then sure. we'll wrap it up with a question that I ask everybody. You've invested in a few companies yourself. Um, how do you approach it? You know, what are the fundamentals? What do you over index on? Like any any tips or interesting stories you want to share there? Yeah, I mean it's I mean it's all very early stage. Um, it's all like typically kind of pre seed, like safe levels. So I over index on like it sounds really cringe, but like vibe. Um, just like whether I think, <laughs> but no, like whether like I really, really like gel with a person and, and like, like whether, and it, I mean, the, like the product obviously has to be like exceptional, but often at this stage, like they don't even really have a product. So I kind of have to like buy into the fact that this founder, whether it's like, whether they're creating a physical like DC product or whether they're like creating, like I, I'm, I'm kind of more interested at the moment really in, in kind of like SaaS or like software that helps e-commerce. So I guess it would, I mean, it would be like recharge and ship of like way a long time ago, but, but businesses that kind of help um, e-commerce. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I specifically focus on, on whether, whether obviously the product sounds like it can take the box, but like the founder story, the founder's background, like whether I think they've kind of got the grit to, to push through and make something really cool. Um, but yeah, typically, it does, typically it's 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 not like I'm doing kind of Series A or like anything like that. So there's there's, there's often not a huge amount to look at other than a pitch deck, maybe a sample or two. Um, but yeah, I I kind of I do a lot. Uh, well, I don't do a lot, but I, I I do speak to a lot of founders. Um, just I mean, part of it is kind of interest. Part of it is. Um, like I, I kind of just love the space uh, and I love getting involved with, with cool people um, doing cool things. So yeah, it's I'm sorry. It's a bit of a wishy washy answer, but no, it's fine. My thesis is D to C and like, and kind of the software that supports that. Um, but yeah, other than that, it's, it's basically vibe. That's great. So last question, we always close it out on. Matt, we'll start with you, and then Tom, you can you can bring us home. So no pressure. Um, <laughs> Matt, what it is. What's, your, what's your number one piece of advice for entrepreneurs or direct consumer operators today? Uh, yeah, um, actually, I had 
keep this like post note in front of me. <laughs> it says, uh, take on projects. It's okay if they fail. <laughs> uh, learn from it and keep growing. So that would be my uh, like word of advice, really. Um, you know, before I actually got into e commerce, I was doing like freelance photography, uh, taking product shots for e commerce brands, um, doing that stuff. I was doing it on my own. So I got to get that experience of like being broke and trying to like figure out how to get business <laughs> going and just all those hardships and just learning on the go. And I feel like just by doing it and really taking in what's happening, um, you know, it, it'll help you in the next stage for whatever's next. And yeah, just don't really don't dwell too much on, on the failures. I guess I could, you know, it's like another way of putting it. Just, just keep on going really. I like it. I'm sure it's helped a ton yeah. in your in your role at, at Recharge and being able to, to sell and relate to entrepreneurs. So I, I love that. Tom, for you, what's your number one piece of advice? Um, so you're kind of carrying on your running or like bringing it home metaphor. Um, like it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, it's something I kind of have to remind myself every day. Like you constantly want things to move faster and you kind of want to get to like the, the level after the next level tomorrow. But nothing ever happens as quickly as it as you kind of hope or like anticipate it so just kind of keep on keep on slugging keep on like clocking clocking in those like clocking in those miles and just keep on pushing forward um because it's like it's it's not fast it is a bit gritty and messy but you end up like if you if you keep on if you put the hours in you end up where you want to get um nice. so yeah just keep pushing on that's great. It's it's like a, a lot of the mainstream media stories, you know, these, these overnight successes, and then it's like that took yeah. fifteen years. A hundred percent. Well, it's like the, it's like the, the Shopify literature that kind of. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. When I first started, I was like, I'm going to be a millionaire by Tuesday, and then like, it did, <laughs> that did not work out. But it's but it kind of it, you just see it growing, and you just got to you got to stick with it. You got to be persistent, um, and yeah. And kind of good luck to you if you're starting a business out there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's a it's a challenge, but it's incredibly rewarding. I, I love it. Persistence, persistence is key, no question. So, um, Tom, Matt, uh, thank you very much for for joining us today. Thank you to Gina in the background for making this all possible. And of course, thanks to everybody who joined us. As always, I know there's a lot you could be doing with your time, and so you know we're always honored when you join us here. We're here every Wednesday, so please join us again next week. Feel free to hit us up if you have suggestions on other brands that you'd like to see us feature. Um, and we'll include um, the recordings for this and also some contact information for Matt as well if any of you guys have questions. Feel, on put, put mine on there as well. If people want to chat more about Definitely. Aurora or any of my businesses, I'm always more than happy. Perfect. I like it. I'll always be closing, Tom. There we yeah. go. So <laughs> we'll, we'll end on that note. Thanks, everybody. See ya. See ya.